Our second scripture reading is from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25 to 27. These are mental health verses. If we would follow Paul's words here, even as we would follow Jesus' words that David just read to us, we would have a different world. So then, putting away falsehood, let us also speak truth to our neighbors in love, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before I pray, I just want to say this is not an easy sermon to preach about anger, and it's not an easy sermon to hear about anger. So I'll make a deal with you. I'll pray for you while you hear it. If you pray for me while I preach it. Fair enough? Will you pray with me? Gracious God, anger is not an easy topic. We've all made mistakes with anger. We've all been the recipients of anger. This sermon strikes at the core of our being. But I pray that this sermon will be redemptive, that we will learn some valuable lessons about how to deal with anger led by your Holy Spirit so that we might become the PhD Christians, the mature Christians who you've called us to be. And if there's anyone for whom this message is a particular tender one today, I pray you will surround them with your love and care and minister to them in a personal way. All this we pray with anticipation for what you have in store for us, and we pray in the strong name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And may all God's people say, Amen. One of my predecessors at Memorial Drive Presbyterian Church in Houston, Texas, that I served for many years, was a man named the Reverend Dr. Charlie Shedd. Charlie and his wife Martha wrote many books on marriage and family life, and years ago they taught a course that they titled simply, How to Raise Children. By the way, they taught that course before they had any children. <laughs> then when they had children, they taught the same course, but they called it Suggestions on Raising Children. <laughs> and then when their children were in the teenage years, they taught the very same class, but they called it Feeble Hints from Fellow Strugglers. <laughs> so I've come this morning to offer you some feeble hints from a fellow struggler about the Christian life and particularly how we as people who say we follow God and believe in the Lordship of Jesus Christ, how we deal with anger. On this Father's Day, I wonder if there's any fathers who have ever said anything you wish you've never said or done anything you wish you'd never done. I wonder if there's any father here who's ever overreacted when your children made a big mistake. My two sons uh, gave me a Father's Day card some years ago that said, Dad, we remember that prayer you used to pray every night before we went to bed when we were kids, and he opened the card up and it says, God help you if you ever do that again. <laughs> Anger is not an easy topic. Anger is a tough topic. I, I must confess to you that sometimes I've taken out my anger at something at the church, at the office, on my family. I hate admitting that. And sometimes I've taken out anger at my family and people at the church. Sometimes, isn't it true, we take out anger from one part of our life into another part of our life, or an, or an unsuspecting or innocent motorist is the object of our anger sometimes. <laughs> Not any of you, of course, but you might know somebody who's had that. But anger is a tough topic, and for me as a pastor, I've actually had to deal with a lot of anger. I've absorbed a lot of anger on behalf of God, on behalf of the church, and. I've been to the court of law with the family court, and uh, there's a divorce court, or they're trying to deal with custody of children, and, and the, the family members are really mad at each other, and they're mad at the judge, and, and mad at the verdict, and I've been to the hospital when someone they thought was going to live died in surgery, and people are mad at the doctor, and mad at the nurse, and mad at the technicians, and they're just mad at everybody, and I've been to the graveside when people get mad at God, and and they get mad at the church, and they get mad at the funeral director. I've been to church meetings when people get mad, and you wouldn't think there'd be anger at church meetings, but sometimes there is anger at church meetings. I remember a church meeting some time ago when uh, a, a member of the session had studied for a year 
to, to add 15 feet of board extension to the stage in the Fellowship Hall. He had a committee, they studied it, they brought in architectural plans, they gave the financial proposal, everything was great, and he made the motion for it, he was a doctor, his name was Ross, he made a motion for it, and was seconded, and we started to discuss it. And during the discussion, somebody brought up that we could use that $70,000, instead of adding an extension to our stage, we could use that for mission in the world. And others said, yeah, you know, we could use that for mission. And before you knew it, they had tabled the motion, and they weren't going to deal with it for several months. They put it off. All this work Ross had done had gone up in flames in a tabled motion. And Ross was calm. He got up from his chair and put his coat over his arm and picked up his briefcase and he walked out of the room and he slammed the door. And I sensed he was angry. <laughs> so I followed him out to the parking lot. I said, Ross, uh, I'm, so, I'm upset. I, I know you're upset too. And, and uh, I'm sorry about what happened tonight. Could I talk to you? Could you tell me what's going on? He said, you don't care. I said, yes, I do care. I wouldn't have come out here if I didn't care. He said, well, well, would you be willing to hear what I have to say? I said, I would. I'd listen to you right now if you want. But he said, no, let's do it in the morning. You need to get back to your meeting. I need to get home. Let's do it in the morning. Would you make me for breakfast? I said, sure. What time and where? He said, well, come to my home. Now, Ross was a doctor, so he had to be at, at the office at about 6 or 6.30 in the morning. He said, uh, meet me at my home for breakfast. I said, what time? He said, 5. Now, I wanted to say, is that a.m. or p.m.? <laughs> But I didn't do that. I was on thin ice with Ross. So I just said, uh, I'll be there at 5 a.m. And I got up the next morning at 3.30 in the morning. I didn't even know there wasn't 3.30, but I got up at 3.30 in the morning and I showered and shaved, got ready. I drove to his house. I was there at quarter to five. I didn't want to miss this moment. So I went in, we had coffee, we had eggs and bacon. It was wonderful. And over breakfast, he said to me, well, here's what was going on with me last night. I thought you preached that every kid in this church is valuable. But now I realize the session doesn't believe every kid is valuable. I said, why do you say that? He said, well, they voted against, they voted against my, my motion. I said, they didn't vote against it. They just tabled it till later. He said, yeah, but they want to give the money to missions. They, they don't want to give the money to the kids of our church. I said, Ross, so tell me about this. He said, well, have you noticed that the last three or four musical productions, there's no room on the stage for our children? Have you noticed that we get a few people, some kids up there, but our stage is so small that the kids have to stand on the ground? And I see grandparents and parents trying to get over somebody to take a photo of their kid in the production, and I don't want any kid to be on the floor when they can be on the stage. I thought you believed that every child in our church is a child of God, and everybody in the world, including you and me, are children of God. I said, I do believe that. He said, well, then, being on the stage and getting celebrated and, have, and realize that God loves them, is very valuable. And when this sophisticated, brilliant doctor from Harvard Medical School got tears in his eyes, I said, Ross, there's something else going on with you here. He said, when I was in college, I wanted to be an athlete. My father wanted an athlete. He didn't value me, he valued my brother. My brother was the state wrestling champion in high school. My dad didn't value me, he valued my brother's athletic ability. I was valedictorian of my high school class. I was captain of the debate team, one of the top debaters in the state, but my brother was the state champion wrestler, and my dad valued that. So when I went to college, I worked my tail off. I, I got in shape, I lifted weights, I ran wind sprints, and I made the college football team. And I called my dad and said, Dad, I got a uniform. He was so proud. I said, there's, a home, there's an away game right near your home where, where we live, and you, maybe you and Mom could come. He said, we'll be there. We'll bring the grandparents. And we, they want, all wanted to see me in uniform. And the Thursday before the Saturday away game, the coach said, this is our first away game. All of our away jerseys haven't come in yet. We've only had 60 away jerseys. So 10 of you, there's 70 on the team, 10 of you will not be able to suit up for this game. And he read the list of the 10 who wouldn't suit up. He said, the hardest call I ever had to make was to tell my dad I wasn't going to be in uniform for the game. And when I looked at my dad, I was on the sidelines in my street clothes. As I looked up to my dad and mom in the stands, my father just kind of shook his head. I don't think he really believed I was on the team and had a uniform. And then with this deep emotion, this guy said to me, Tom, I don't want any child in this church to ever feel what I felt, that they're left out. I want them to feel like they're children of God. They're included. I said, Ross, would you tell the session this? He said, they don't care. 
I said, yes, they do care deeply. They care for you. Tell them. So he told them, well, of course, the session voted unanimously to add the 15 feet of board space to the stage. But what happened there was a lot more important than adding 15 feet to the stage. What happened that night was we all realized that we carry things from our childhood and we carry things from our past or one setting in life and we bring it into another setting and then we explode. But if people just understood what we're carrying, of course, they could realize they'd be sympathetic and we learned a great lesson that night. So from that time on, our session always took the time to listen to one another and pray for each other and hear each other and be sympathetic to all the many things we are carrying. I wish I could tell you that these stories about anger end as wonderfully as that story ended actually, because it was good for our church. But the story of Leonard Holt didn't end that well. Leonard Holt was a respected plant manager. He was a Little League baseball coach, a Little League baseball umpire, a good father, a good husband. He was a good worker at his plant, but, but he was passed over for one promotion, then another, then another. And he always thought that maybe the reason people were gathering on the plant floor was to talk about him. And then he had an issue at home where the tree in between his house and his neighbor's house uh, needed to be chopped down. The city said they needed to be chopped down, but the issue was who was going to pay for it. So every time in the neighborhood when two or three people would gather together, Leonard Holt thought that they were talking about him. And so he was building this up and building this up and building this up. And Leonard Holt should have listened to the advice of Henrietta Mears, the Christian ed director at a church in Hollywood, California, who said, we wouldn't worry nearly so much about what other people think of us if we realize how infrequently they do. <laughs> Leonard should have taken that seriously because when they're talking on the plant floor and they're talking in his home, he thought they're talking about him. It was all about him. And it was like a beach ball under the water in a swimming pool or in a lake and you're holding that beach ball under the water and it consumes all your energy and all your anger and it's building up and building up and building up and one day it exploded and Leonard Holt went into his plant took two guns, I hate to say this, and he shot and killed seven people with whom he'd worked for 15 years or more. And then, in addition to that, he wounded eight others. It took several hours to subdue him and lead him off to jail. And I'm sure you've all read about Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut, where this past week, the class of 2024 graduated, but the kids were six years old when that terrible shooting occurred back in 2012. And, and 20 of their classmates didn't graduate because they were not there. They had died when they were in the first grade. This topic of gun violence and anger is a terrible topic to deal with. It's, a, it's an awful topic. But the reason I bring it up is I believe if we're going to get the PhD in Christianity, we've got to learn to deal with anger. Actually, anger can be redemptive. Anger can have a good possibility. So the Bible says this amazing thing. Be angry, but do not sin. Jesus said, if you're angry at your brother, don't offer your gift to the altar. Go and be reconciled to your brother and then come back and, and offer your gift to the altar. If you're angry with your sister, leave the, the altar. Go be reconciled to your sister and then come back and leave, offer your gift. And then Paul says, be angry, but do not sin. The sin is letting the sun go down on your anger and it builds up like the beach ball and the beach ball and the beach ball and it goes roaring and roaring and roaring and then it rages and the Greek word for that is thumos, T-H-U-M-O-S. There's an explosion like Leonard Holt happened in the plant. Be very sure anger can be good. Jesus was angry at the money changers, at the Pharisees, sometimes angry and frustrated with his disciples. Throughout the scripture, God is angry. God is angry at the faithlessness of people. So God gives us a choice. And the choice is this. Will we let the sun go down on our anger and let it build up and build up and build up until it's something far beyond what we should have? Or will we make a conscious choice to give our anger to God and keep short accounts and speak the truth to one another in love quickly, not letting the sun go down the anger, not building up, but speak the truth to one another quickly so it can be redemptive. If we're gonna get the PhD in Christianity, we've gotta learn healthy outlets for our anger. So 
Fred Rogers has made a career out of this. He's been concerned about children, Mr. Rogers has. And Mr. Rogers has always been trying to figure out how to make the biblical principles relevant to children. Fred Rogers, maybe you didn't know, is a Presbyterian minister. He a, was a good friend of mine while he was alive. He's a wonderful man, a great man of God, great man of faith, a humble man. But he wanted to teach children the values of Jesus. So he taught them to play the piano loudly when they're mad to hit a punching bag when they're mad, to run around the yard when they're mad, or to sing a song when they're mad. When you're feeling mad and you want to roar, take a deep breath and count to four. <laughs> it's good advice, isn't it, for children? It's also good advice for adults. Two basketball players for the Golden State Warriors, Draymond Green and Steph Curry, have issues with anger. Draymond Green takes his issues out by exploding at people. He yells at the ref, he swears at the ref, he calls the ref names, and eventually the ref gets so mad, the ref throws him out of the game. And then Draymond Green will hit a player, or push a player, or trip a player, or try to get that player thrown out of the game. And then Draymond Green's thrown out of the game for that. He's got these anger issues and they plague him. Is there anybody here who's got anger issues? Anybody here who works with somebody or lives with somebody who has anger issues? And this Father's Day, anger is a big topic. But see, Steph Curry deals with it differently. I, I know, I've met Steph Curry, he's a Christian, and actually he's an amazing person, because what he does is when there's a fight breaking out, Draymond Green's going there trying to, to, to make it worse. Dr uh, Steph Curry's trying to make it better. He's pulling the players away from the fight. And here's what Steph Curry does. When he misses five or six or 10 shots in a row, he's one of the greatest shooters ever in professional basketball. But what Steph Curry does is he keeps shooting but then he also finds another way to make a contribution to his team, like play good defense, like get some assists, like pass the ball well, like dribble well. He tries to make another contribution. Instead of getting mad that he's missing all these shots, he finds another way to make a difference. In other words, he channels his anger in a healthy way. Ah, there's the sermon. Channeling anger in a healthy way. St. Augustine said, listen carefully, fourth century Christian leader, hope has two daughters, anger and courage. Anger at the way things are and courage to not let things stay the way they are. Big lesson there. Hope has two daughters, anger and courage. So Rosa Parks was angry in 1955 in Montgomery, Alabama, and when James Blake, the bus driver, said, you've got to move to another area of the bus, you've got to get up and give your seat to a white person, she remained seated. Now, as you know, she lost her job as a seamstress for it. She was arrested for it. But as you also know, when she remained seated, the world stood up. When she, stood up, when she sat down for justice, the world stood up for justice, and Rosa Parks made a tremendous difference in the world. But notice, she kept her anger under control. She kept short accounts. She didn't let it build up and build up and build up. She kept the short accounts, and she dealt with that person truthfully and lovingly and calmly, but she was mad. But she found a healthy way to deal with the anger. You know, I have one more week here at Independent Presbyterian Church. I'm already kind of grieving that next Sunday is my last Sunday, but I've had a magnificent opportunity and, and I've come to love this congregation and love the staff and it's just been one of the great privileges and joys, frankly, of my whole life to be here for these over two months. But one of the greatest moments of these two months has been going with Melissa Fitzpatrick down to Montgomery, Alabama. I saw the lynching museum and the museum where they talk about the slave trade and I read some of the stories and saw some of the stories and depictions of some of the stories of these families that were pulled apart because a family member was going to be lynched and I also saw the stories of where the family member is going to be sold into slavery and the mother or the dad or the child would never see their parent or their daughter or their son again ever and and you just have to weep at this and then I saw the statistic about the precise nature of these boats that come over to America, and all these boats had exact precise measurements of the tea and the tar and the turpentine. They had exact measurements, how much tea, how much tar, how much turpentine, how many containers of each, 
precise nature. But then when you look at the statistics of the slaves that are carried over, you realize they didn't know exactly how many slaves were shipped, nor did they know how many slaves arrived because the slaves, I hate to even say this, were thought of as three-fifths of a person. So, I've wondered how Brian Stevenson has done it. I've wondered how in the world has he told this story? You know about the Equal Justice Initiative and the magnificent work he's doing there. But, but I, I wonder how does he do, how does he tell this story? Well, he wants to tell the story so that people will never repeat it, never think of it again. He, he wants people to, to think about it and not get it out of their mind so they'll never repeat it again. But I wondered, how does he get the strength to do this? I mean, I was shot after a day down there, and I wonder, how does he work with this day after day after day? And what I realized was, as I did research on him, and I've heard him speak on this topic, that he is a person of faith. See, when he was a little boy, he grew up in the AME church in Delaware, and he heard the gospel that all people are worth something, all people regardless of their color, race, or creed. He learned that. He learned to sing the hymns. He went to Sunday school. He learned the Bible passages. And he needed that faith. Because when he was 16 years old, I didn't realize this till recently, his maternal grandfather walked in on a robbery in the home, and he was stabbed to death in his own home. And Brian Stevenson had to figure out how to deal with that, how to deal with that anger. But Brian Stevenson said, I grew up in a church that taught me not to worry as much about revenge as reconciliation. Let that lean against you a little bit. I learned not to worry so much about revenge as reconciliation and redemption. And Brian Stevenson then said, I learned in that that, that the worst thing a person does does not define them as a person. We are more than the worst thing we ever did. And Brian Stevenson has done this all of his life. But he, it's, all of this is rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ and in his faith. So my beloved IPC friends and family, and many of you have become like family to me in this time, I beg you to, to do what Brian Stevenson did and what Steph Curry did and what Fred Rogers did and what Rosa Parks did. I beg you to take your anger and put it under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Take your anger and put it under the Lordship of God. Give it to God. Don't wait another minute to do it. Do it today. And the reason I say do it today is, do you remember Leonard Holt, that plant manager from Pennsylvania, who shot seven and wounded eight? He waited much too long. Think about it. Amen.